I wanted to go back today to revisit this, this quantum idea, quantum perspective of looking at the nature of reality, how the kingdom works, and specifically uh, in prayer. And, you know, I don't, I don't want to talk about this stuff to try to wow you or present some type of quasi new age approach to faith. To, to me, looking at quantum reality and, and quantum physics and all that stuff that we can glean, it, it's, it's a, you know, it's like parabolic to me. In other words, it, just, it makes me think about spiritual matters in a different way because of how even the physical realm works, right? You know, it's like we can clearly understand the things that are unseen by observing the things that are seen. So, so I don't try to claim that uh, we're trying to manipulate matter, and that's faith, right? Like, I'm not saying we through the power of positive thinking, we're now new ageists. But I, but I am addressing the reality that Christ said all things are possible for those who believe, right? So I, I, it's, I'm constantly trying to balance the perspective in my mind and my understanding, specifically today talking about the area of prayer of, you know, what, what is legally appropriate for us to pray for how can we understand prayer? How should I pray in this particular situation? What is the will of God? What's not the will of God? You know, and I, I think it was last week I addressed the will of God in terms of it's inappropriate to, pl to pray for something and then say, if it be thy will or Lord willing, if it's something that Jesus paid for in his death, burial, and resurrection. So you know the will of God if it was touched by what Jesus paid for on that cross. In other words, you know it's the will of God for you to be forgiven because that's what he paid for. You know that it's the will of God for you to have eternal life. You know that it's the will of God for that root of sin to be cut away from you and be replaced with his spirit and a new heart. You know that that's God's will, that you experience life and that more abundantly because that's what he paid for. Now people are wrapping up. I don't know if we went too cold, but let's, did it just cut off? <laughs> just you? Sorry. Everybody look. At <laughs> uh, and, and so that then you get into the areas that are a little bit more challenging and difficult in terms of Healing, right? Healing or wisdom or, you know, if Jesus is made unto us wisdom, sanctification, and redemption, and you don't know what you're supposed to do or what God would want you to do, it is perfectly legal for you to expect to have the knowledge of God in any given situation because Christ is made unto you wisdom. You can expect in every situation when you pray to know God's will and to know that God will manifest because Christ in you manifests the wisdom that you need. And not just information, not just knowledge, but wisdom. And wisdom is the practical application of knowledge. So you might know something, but wisdom is how to apply it. Okay, I get that the Word says this, but how do I live it out? God's like, I'm glad you asked. Here you go. Boom. And, and, it, but th and then that's where that active, alive relationship with God comes into place because it's, you know, unfortunately, oftentimes what we're trying to do when we pray is get information from God. As if we lack information, and if He would tell me this, then I would know. And that's not the reality. What He's trying to do is get you to shift in your heart and in your thinking to see that you already are that which you're praying to become, right? Now, there is that moment, there is that aspect of transformation, but in terms of what Jesus paid for, healing is on the inside of you. Wisdom is on the inside of you. Purity and sanctification and holiness is on the inside of you. It is improper for you to desire sin as a believer. It, it's, it's contrary to your nature to desire sin. 
If you're struggling with the temptation to sin, it's because you're fostering the opportunity in your mind, and then you're letting it stir your emotions, and then you're like, mm, that feels like a pretty good idea. Let's do that, whether it be outbursts of anger or, or whatever it might be. You know, Unfortunately, a lot of times it happens at that deeper other than conscious level where those desires are fostered and and, and you, you host the opportunity for sin, but it's not natural to you any longer. That's a, that's a whole other thing to go into, but this, this idea of, of uh, quantum prayer, so this, all this came out of this passage. Um, let, me, let me find it here. Acts 19, if you, if you would follow me back there. Acts 19, starting in verse 11, I was just praying, and I, and I wanted to go back to this idea of, of prayer. And again, I'm not trying to teach a mystery. I'm not trying to teach you how to operate in spiritual mysteries. What I want to do is look at some of this information to change kind of how we think, really, really for one thing. You know, if, when you walk out of here today, if one thing happens... I, I hope it's this one thing. Everybody listening? Here's what I hope you walk out of here with today. Hang on, Chelsea. Don't go anywhere. <laughs> I want everybody to walk out of here today with restored hope in the power of prayer. Okay, now you can go. Are you with me, though? Like, because we pray. I, I mean, so I've prayed for people. I've, I've literally seen cancerous tumors disappear. Felt them in people's like bodies. Pray, and they go away. And then they go to the doctor, and the doctor says, well, where'd that tumor go? I've seen like these dental miracles. I was thinking about this. This kid one time, forgive me, because uh, this is cringeworthy, but we, and if you, you can go num, 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 if you need to. But we were at a, just a party at somebody's house, and there were a bunch of kids running around. There was a trampoline. And you know those trampolines that have the nets around them? This kid must have been eight, nine years old, maybe, jumped up somehow, got his front tooth hooked in the net, and it just pulled his tooth right out. Clean, and, and, and he, he came up to me. I just happened to be the closest one, I guess, and he put his tooth in my hand, and it was giant. I don't know if you've ever seen a tooth with the root still. It's like, I couldn't believe how big this thing was. And I'm, I'm looking at it, and there's a perfect hole in it. I'm like, this is amazing. And then I'm like, oh, my gosh, you know. <laughs> and he's bleeding, and his mom's freaking out. And, and uh, I, don't, I don't, it's been a while, so I don't remember the exact sequence of events. But we decided to wash it, put it back in his mouth. Yeah. It contacted the, and prayed, contacted the dentist. They couldn't see him. I think it took a couple of days before they could see, because they, they, they weren't that worried about it. Not, not trying to, you know, disparage the dentist, but just a kid. I don't even, I guess, I th actually, I think it was a permanent tooth. But by the time he got to the dentist, the dentist looked at the x-rays and said, now, which tooth came out? I mean, you know, it just, either the nerve and it all just reattached, but I just don't, I don't think that happens. <laughs> but it happened. Wow. And, you know, I mean, I've seen some pretty radical miracles. And then I've prayed for people, and, it, and nothing happened. You ever been there? Probably more that than miracles. Well, not probably for sure. And I don't, I don't see that in Jesus' ministry. And, and so I, I'm not, and I don't put that on God. In other words, I don't want to then saddle us with, well, what do we need to do? to get more anointing and get more power and get more faith and revive. You know, I think that's why people that are real heavy, have a real hip, people meeting, you know, Christian circles that are real heavy on the gifts of the Spirit and healing are, are constantly preaching revivalism is because we're so bad at miracles that they're, they're like, that's what's going to change everything and miracles and power and... So it's not happening. So if God would do something and sweep the land, you know, and it's like, then it gets into this, I call it revivalism because it's this mentality that's, 
it, to me, it's, it, it, it leans toward carnal, carnality, really, because it's kind of looking for a specific physical outcome. But then again, I think we should absolutely be walking in all the strength and power that God has placed in us. I mean, Jesus said, the works that I do, you'll do. Amen. So this is not a message about miracles per se. I think miracles should just be a side effect of the Christian life, really. Amen. I had a pastor, and this will make you mad, but he used to say, miracles are for losers. In other words, if you need a miracle, you missed God somewhere along the way. Yeah, that's about how you, that usually goes over. <gasps> Just keep going. So anyway, this passage here is, is what I want to kind of circle around. I have a few other things to read, but um, Acts 19, 11. Now, this is, this is the Apostle Paul, and it's, you know, it's an amazing story. Paul is in um, Athens, and he's basically philosophizing with the philosophers. What is the word? Philosophizing? Doing philosophy. With the philosophers, right? And in this region, uh, in Ephesus, in Athens, they had been influenced by the Stoics and Aristotle. And he even quotes one of their, their poets. I, I looked it up. I think his name is Arstus, A-R-S-T-U-S is who he quotes here. Uh, before this particular passage, I'm only reading 11 and 12, but actually, sorry, that's a different section. Anyway, before I get to that, this is really something that's been stirring my thinking in terms of how to look at prayer. I don't know, going into this new year, you know, ec the expectations that we have. So Acts 19, 11, <clears throat> this says, God was performing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul. So that, the, so that handkerchiefs or aprons were even carried from his body to the sick and diseases left them and evil spirits went out. Think about that. Think about somebody that you know that's sick and we have a box of tissues up here and you take a tissue, give it to that person and they get healed. What's going on there? I mean, is that God pretending to do something as if the handkerchief or the tissue? I mean, why, what's going on there? You know, and so to me what this starts to do is it takes prayer and answered prayer. I put answered in quotes because a lot of people's perspective of prayer is God's either answering them or he's not answering them. I don't see, God, I don't see prayer as sending messages up to heaven and then God, you know, like he's Santa Claus, receiving the requests, naughty list for you, good list for you, here's a blessing for you, here's no blessing for you. Like he's determining who gets answers to prayer, you know what I mean? Like that's where the will of God comes in. If Jesus paid for it, you have the right to expect it to be a reality in your life right now. And if it's not, it's not because he's saying no, it's because for whatever reason on our end we're having trouble hosting the manifestation of it. And so when Jesus addresses these matters, he always talks about doubt in the heart, which I understand how offensive that can be, especially for people who've dealt with illnesses for a very long time. I don't pretend to know what you're going through, and I don't pretend to say that you're wrong. I just, but I, but I, I do want to give hope. I do want to reinforce faith in God and trust in God. Because God, through Christ, paid for it. Amen. Jesus came that you would have life, and that more abundantly. The Spirit of the living God is giving life to your physical body. Jesus showed us who God is, and what did he do? He went about doing good and healing all. And then he said, the works that I do, you're going to do, and even greater than those. So, again, I'm not, I'm not, this is not necessarily about miracles as much as it is the deeper aspect of prayer. Because I think a lot of us just kind of shy away from prayer. We just, you know, we just don't really live that prayerful lifestyle because we've been disappointed. Our hearts are hardened to it. You know, we've seen it not happen more than we've seen it happen. And, and I, and I, and I want to reframe that, dig into that a little bit, and kind of restore our hope in prayer, the power of prayer. And hope is the confident expectation of good things. 
I want us to, to, to have a sense of expect, expectancy when we pray. You know, because I think subtly, a lot of times when we, be, when we pray, we know that that's the Christian thing to do. I mean, we believe, right? We believe, but do we hold on until the manifestation, right? And I, and I, I think even the Spirit-led church body of Christ has done a little bit of, of a disservice because we've, we've, we've tried to over-teach experiencing the Spirit of God. And I just want to frame it in the in light of relationship than like mystical, quasi-spiritual dead works. But, but in terms of prayer, so think about that. You could put that, actually put that back up if you would. What, what's going on there? Think, I mean, what, what happened? To me, I'm thinking, all right, so here's a handkerchief. Paul either prayed over it, but it, it said, it didn't say, it doesn't say. It, it says, even handkerchiefs or aprons were brought from his body to the sick. I mean, did he just have like a pocket with handkerchiefs in them? You know, I don't know. But it's not like he prayed over these things. It's just, here's, so here's where I get, so this is where the quantum aspect comes in for me, right? And again, I'm, I'm not trying to eliminate spiritual activity. I'm not trying to erase mystery. It's fine to have the mystery in there. But I think there's some things, specifically when we look at how the quantum level works, that we can gain some insight into something like this. You know, we know now uh, that there's atoms and protons and neutrons and all this stuff going on. It's almost as if the molecules of the handkerchief were excited to the point where they emanated the same kind of power that Paul emanated. Now, I don't even see... Uh, Paul putting something onto the handkerchief and then it going and then it coming off of the handkerchief and then to the person. Maybe that's it. Maybe he smeared some healing anointing on it or something. You know, that's, I know that's how a lot of people would teach it. But to me, it's, it's even deeper than that. It's as if this inanimate object became influenced by the power that was in Paul and began to resonate the same kind of energy, spiritual healing power that Paul did, and then it had the same effect on this person as if Paul prayed for them. That's, that's how I see it in my mind. Where you go with it, that's fine. But the point, point is, that is amazing. It left his body, touched another person, and that person got healed. Are you kidding me? He didn't, it doesn't even say he prayed. That, it reminds me, so when we talked about quantum entanglement in prayer a couple of weeks ago, we talked about Jesus and the uh, Roman soldier coming to him and saying, my servant, and Jesus said, yeah, no. You, the fact that you understand that I have the authority over sickness and that all I have to do is speak and the created realm will rearrange itself to match what I desire, that's great faith, he says. It's, it's, so, so the, where the quantum aspect comes in is this idea of non-locality. Now, let me try to, you know, I'm not a scientist. I just, I, I, this stuff is interesting to me. So locality would be the handkerchief was with Paul. It followed a very clear path and then went to the person and had an effect. That means you could locate it the whole time. With Jesus, there was a non-locality. In other words, he spoke and independent. There was no messenger that left and went and told that person. There was no direct, there was no phone, right? There was no nothing. It was just in that moment, the non-local aspect was Jesus released it or spoke it here, and there it became the reality. That would be an, an example of what non-locality is. So in terms of quantum physics, um, the, the Newtonian model, in other words, the standard model that we typically were raised with and most of the world is based on, is cause and effect. In other words, for information or a message to get anywhere, there has to be some type of channel. You flip the light switch back there and the light comes on here, 
You know, if you didn't understand that there's wiring affecting that light, you would think that that's magic. But there's all kinds of tests and studies that have been done where particles that have been entangled or affected in some way where they are connected in some way have been separated, like hundreds of miles even, you affect one, it's, it's as, imagine my hands as two balls and they're separated, one's on the moon and one's here, and this hand turns, instantly this hand turns, you know, kind of representing particles. And, and they've measured this in such a way where they recognize there seems to be some type of method of transference or communication of information from this point to this point instantaneously without something connecting those things. That's non-locality in quantum physics. It's as if I tickled Lyle and Adam laughed. <laughs> or Callie. <laughs> I mean, you know, just to kind of get, oh, uh, because the science part of it is weird, but but like, and, and that's, where, that's where we get new agey and we try to make things happen and we think, Ooh. But, but, but you do see Jesus speaking and instantaneously, remotely, somebody gets healed, right? You, think about this. I mean, you ever picked up the phone? Of course, now we look at it and it's like, oh, I'm not answering that phone. That call. But like, you're thinking about somebody and then they call you. Or, or uh, like we saw Wednesday night confirmation in the ex, in the gifts of the spirit. Lisa was praying something and uh, Krista heard the same thing and that's a confirmation and, and they didn't tell each other what they heard but when she started praying Krista was like oh I'm hearing the exact same thing. That, that's non-locality. That, that is God be, you know connecting us. So, so what they come up with is there must be something that connects everything together. And, of course, then you get into different versions of, of how to interact with that. The, the, the basic idea, ultimately, that even quantum physics says is that everything is connected somehow in some way. So I then translate that into, so, so again, I'm not trying to say let's manipulate matter and become wizards of natural law or anything like that. I'm saying we are part of a kingdom. We are part of a spiritual reality through which everything is connected. So when you pray, it doesn't matter distance, time, frequency, how bad the illness is, how depressed that person is, how dark the situation may be. The Spirit of the living God is powerful enough to manifest in that situation and change that situation instantaneously. I personally, when I pray, I want to have hope that it can get better. I want to have hope that the promise that Jesus died for that person to experience is an actual possibility. Amen. I don't want to pray in doubt. I don't, I don't want to pray and, and wonder why it didn't happen. I'm sick of that. And we got a long way to go, and I don't even like saying it that way, but it's like, I get it, this is challenging, and it's challenging to me too, because I think ultimately the Christian church just pretty much just, you know, re relegates prayer then to niceties or uh, cliche Christianity, you know. But I want to have hope in prayer. And, and so, when I, when e so even just the physical realm being able to be connected in such a way where something all the way over there is affected by something that happens right here and it, at the moment, it's unexplainable. They call it the, Max Planck called it the matrix. Some people call it the quantum field or the unified field theory. But they're, they're trying to figure out why does something over there that's not at all connected here respond when this is affected? Well, here's what I see. I see that we are quantum entangled with God. You know, as he, you can take that now, as he is, so are we in this world. So that we would have confidence in the day of judgment. Huh? That's it. Yeah. As he is, so are we in this world, it specifically says. I, do I have that in the notes, First John? Was it First John 4, 7? Yeah. Would you pull that up? 
1 John 4, 7. So, all right, so when I hear that, I'm not thinking of a, a religious perspective of what I have to do to be like him. Like, in other words, that doesn't incite performance to me. That's, that's a present reality. And so then I think about this quantum non-locality thing. And, and then I have these, because I've watched a lot of videos on this, and they always they do gloves or shoes or whatever and quantum entanglement. Uh, you know, there's, there's, there's particles that are connected, and they're always showing how when one turns, the other turns. Well, if as he is, so are we. Yeah, let us love one another for love is God. And everyone, no, that's not it. What, what is it? 417. 1 John 417. So, yeah, love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. I mean, God wants you to be bold because as he is, so are we in this world. Now think about that. How is God? Perfect. You good? As he is, so are we. So then, so then, I, so then I have these two. Is, are y'all tracking with me on this? Am I getting too weird on you? I don't have a fever. <laughs> Not out of my head, but I just so so like as he is. All right, so I'm so then I'm seeing these particles. One turns, the other turns. One matches this frequency. This one matches this frequency. One matches this speed. Matches it. Uh, there's there's this connection where there's an instant mirror response. Just all the natural physical realm. I read this as he is. God turns, I turn. God looks at somebody with compassion, I look at them with compassion. God notices His glory, I acknowledge His glory in me. God enjoys health and perfect life, so it is within me. The Spirit of the living God is giving life to my physical body. So, so even experiencing that which Jesus paid for is not a Newtonian transactional form of prayer where I have to ask God to give me something, as he is, so am I. I want to become aware, fully persuaded, that that's how connected I am to God, that his reality is my reality. Jesus, you know, these things would sound weird if we didn't have the Bible, because Jesus prayed, your will be done on earth as it is in, as it is in heaven. Paul's, there were handkerchiefs that left his body and went and did miracles. The handkerchief did miracles. What? Jesus showed us God. And what did he do? He set people free from condemnation who legally deserved death. He challenged the burdensome improper use of the law as a yoke. He healed, he encouraged, he shared his inheritance from God. As he is, so are we. I want to be so in tune with the heart of God that, you know, and did you think about Jesus? You know, Jesus was moved with compassion. It's, I think it's because he was entangled with God. There's that connection, there's that, call it invisible, whatever. God is in me. Luke 17. You can go put that up, please. She's like, I'm trying. Luke 17, 20. Now when he was asked by the Pharisees <clears throat> when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them and said, the kingdom of God does not come with outward observation. I, I think most of people, go back to 20, I think most of Christians' expectation is they'll believe when they see it. When the reality is, you'll see it when you believe it. Yep. The kingdom of God does not come without outward observation, verse 21, nor will they say, see here or see there, for indeed the kingdom of God is within you. Again, that's a quantum 
statement, in my opinion, in my mind, in my thinking, the kingdom is in me. There's a need here. I'm going to pray if it's receptive, if people are asking for prayer. yeah, Because Jesus didn't just jump into every situation and pray. He responded to people's questions, to, to their ask. Jesus, would you? he's like, well, what do you want for me to do for you? Well, if you're willing, I'd like for you to do this. Well, I'm willing. Here, be it done unto you according to your faith. So in other words, they saw something in him they could connect with and be their reality. The kingdom of heaven is within. When you pray, know that. Know that the very kingdom of God is in you, the power and the authority. Not only do you have eternal life, but you have, we have the mandate to represent the authority of God in this prayer. Prayer is not asking God to stand up off his throne and come here and do something. Prayer is getting into harmony with what specifically with what Christ accomplished and declaring that. You know, I talked about last week, painting the picture with words of the will of God. If, if it's paid for in the blood of Christ, you have the right to speak it and believe unto manifestation. If it's something outside of that, then your job is to seek the word, to get his mind on that subject, to get his, how he thinks about it, get the wisdom of what to do about it, how to pray. So in other words, you know that he paid for it in his blood, and if, it, and if it's not something that he paid for in his blood, he'll give you the wisdom of what to do. And then you'll know his will. And he won't leave you in the dark. We have the mind of Christ. And then this final passage here is just interesting to me. Again, same type of concept. This is Acts 17, verse 26. Um, and, and this is where Paul was reasoning with the philosophers. And <clears throat> he's talking about this unknown God. You know, the, in, this, in this area, they had statues to all these different gods, idols. And there's even one to the unknown God. And so that's the one he picks out and uses as an illustration to present the, uh, the idea of who Christ is, right? And he said... And he has made, talking about this unknown God, and he has made from one blood every, so talk, that's, that's um, talking about Adam, from one man. And he's made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him. So he paints this picture of people looking in the dark for God. People are grope. I like the word grope specifically. In other translations, it's reach for or try to find, but grope gives that picture. It's like you're, there's an expectation that he's close enough to be touched, but, but groping indicates I'm, I'm either blind or I'm in the dark and I don't know and I'm trying to, right? But then he reframes it and he says, you're not trying to reach out. You're not groping for him as if he's removed from you. He says, though he is not far from each one of us. And then he goes even deeper, 28, for in him we live and move and have our being. Now think if that's if you're in him. You're saturated in his presence, right? So if the kingdom of God is here, if the kingdom of God is at hand, to me it's I think of it, it's a, it's a realm in which we can operate, but it's accessed by grace through faith. The kingdom of God is experienced by grace through faith. Everything that God has for you, it's here, it's available, it's in Christ, Christ is in you. It's just a belief away, but it's in that realm that's a higher resonant frequency energetically, you could say, that we must resonate into to match, but it's here now. So just a quick illustration. Are you still with me? Because I love this stuff, even if y'all don't. But <laughs> You can pull that down for just a second. So, so dimensionally, let me just say, you know, we live in three or four dimensions. There's, I can go forward and I can go backward. That's one dimension. I can go this way and then I can go this way. 
that's a second dimension. And if it's flat and you move around like on a piece of paper, that's a two-dimensional reality. And then you add up and down as the third dimension, then, we, then things have depth, right? You can move around within those three dimensions. They're not mystical dimensions, they're directional, spatial dimensions, right? And so then it's been theorized that time may be a fourth dimension. I know that's kind of changed, but for our talk, so time is a, it's within this spatial existence, you're being affected by time. Just look in the mirror if you don't know what I'm talking about. You put an apple on the table, it will rot because it's affected by time even though it doesn't move in space. So that's a dimension. Is it moving? It seems to be only moving in one direction. You can't go backward into time. But, but, but if you just stand there, it's still affecting you. So it's a realm, it's a dimension affecting you. Like time, the kingdom of God is a dimension affecting you. But it's affecting you positively. It's not entropic. It's not decaying. It's not waning in strength. It's increasing in life and power and abundance. When you connect your heart with that kingdom, you begin to experience the effects of that dimension. So, so it's, it's like, wouldn't you like to choose if you're participating in the realm of time or not? <laughs> like, let me just push the time button. Beep. Push the time button, and I'm not affected by time. But, but it's like you can't choose that, but we can with the, the kingdom realm, the way that we think, the way that we believe. And I'm just telling you, your actions, your obedience to the Word of God affects your heart's confidence to be able to participate in that realm. Are you with me? Yeah. So in other words, how you live the degree of sin that you entertain and, and live in, it affects your heart in such a way that, that hardens, and whether guilt or shame or just loving the darkness, keeps you from engaging that realm. I want to pray in such a way where I have hope that I'm in that kingdom realm now because Jesus said that kingdom is in you. Now, it's appointed unto man wants to die. We have to die out of these bodies, so we do, live in, we do live in this paradox. I'm not saying that everything is just going to be perfect in this dimension, but in general, we can experience life as Jesus modeled it when he was here. That's what I want to, that's what I want to do when I pray. I want to remember all of that. I don't want to limit my prayer to what happened the last time I prayed for somebody and then drag up all the emotion associated and related to what did or didn't happen. I want to go into prayer thinking there's an unlimited potential and possibility. What I'm going to do is focus on the possibility of the kingdom of God affecting this situation. That's what I'm going to put my hope and expectation in. I'm not going to sit and foster and entertain these negative feelings, this disappointment, this fear, this irrational, kingdom irrationality, you know, to entertain. You, you look at the corporate media and politics and advertising. Advertising is to get you to think that your life is missing something and will be complete when you buy this product. Christianity is lived for a lot of people from that same perspective. But the bill of sale is obedience to then get God to bless you. But it's a paradox, because if you live obedient to the Word of God, it will tune your heart to be receptive to the blessing that He's already given you. But then I want to pray. I want, I want to see not just miracles, but anything that could be possible because we're connected directly to the kingdom of God only limited by our own expectations. So I don't know if that helps you bringing the science stuff in there, and I don't even fully try to explain it, but, but in my mind, that's what I'm thinking. As he is, so are we in this world. I'm not trying to get him to do something to me or for me. I want to recognize this is, the re this is my reality because I am in Christ and Christ is in me. I know this about the character of God, 
I know these promises. I know what he wants for me. I know his will. I know what Jesus paid for. I know the model of Christ. I know how Paul prayed. I see who God worked through and what they did. I understand what God would want for humanity. And in light of all that packaged together, I, that puts me in the place of believing in accordance with who God has revealed himself to be. And I want to be able to isolate that in every situation for myself and for others when I teach or pray or anything like that. But, but you got to know the word to think that way. So I just, I just want us to have hope in prayer. So you, you can kind of just forget all that stuff and, and, and just know all things are possible for those who believe. Mark eleven twenty four 24 says, believe that you have received and it will be yours. Believe that you have received and it will be yours. The space in between is patience unto manifestation and getting doubt out of your heart. Oh, we did have that. I forgot I put that up there. Therefore, therefore, I tell you the truth. I, therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask, this is Jesus. Whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received, and it will be good. Is it the one before that or after? What did I have in there? Because it's... There we go. Truly, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart. That, that's the troublesome statement. Does not doubt in his heart. That, that's the issue. If you want to know why, you can say it's God, it's timing, it's this, it's that, but here's the issue. Does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. Well, I've believed, I've tried everything, I've done everything. You don't understand. You're right, I don't, I don't understand. I don't know what you've been through, but I know what I've been through, and I'm willing to take responsibility over my heart. And then just that last verse, 24. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it. Why would he say that? Why did he say that? Why did he say, believe that you've already received it? Why would, why would Jesus say that? Because it's true. Because God has given you all things that pertain unto life and godliness in Christ. And all his promises are yes and amen. amen. And you are a joint heir with Christ. Amen. And as he is, so are you in this world. Amen. And his life is giving spirit to your physical body. And those things that Jesus did, you shall do also, so that you could be a blessing to this earth. And whatever else is the reality. Amen. Knowing the end from the beginning. Let's stand up. Father, we thank you for your word. I think I end every message that way, but I, I love it. I thank you so much for your word because it gives us the proper channel to think on and it shows us what we have the right to believe and, and where we need to change our beliefs. Father, we don't want to limit you. And, and it's not a hard thing. Basically, all we need to do is believe you are who you say that you are. That's it. And then obedience comes out of that. Faith comes out of that. Everything is a response to looking at you and, and seeing you. Even recognizing that as, we, as you are, so are we in this world. Gospel of hope. And we want to affect the world. We want to take your message, the effects of your kingdom into this world. We want to experience that abundant life that Jesus came to give us. And we want other people to just know how good that you are. Know how good that you are so that they would give you their lives and receive the gift of eternal life and then live lives that bring glory to you. I thank you. I thank you that we're in the midst of your kingdom now. Help us believe. Lord, we believe and help our unbelief. Amen, 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 amen. Jesus said you must be born again to enter into his kingdom. 
He's done everything to provide eternal life for you, and you only receive it by grace through faith. And we want to help you be sure in your salvation. You know, maybe you're new to Christianity. Maybe you're discovering things about God for the first time in your life, and you don't really know what it's all about. I've been there, trust me. I wasn't raised in a Christian home. I didn't know anything about God when I got born again and tried to approach the Bible, and it didn't make sense to me. So we want to help you. If you go to forward.church and click on Who is Jesus, we have a simple article on there that explains salvation, everything he did for you, how to begin to read the Bible and start to live a Christian life and incorporate his principles and how to engage the Holy Spirit for empowerment. You know, his grace wants to transform you. His love wants to make you whole. And we want to help you. If you've made the decision to be born again today for the first time, or maybe even a recommitment, and you're just not even sure what to do, how to approach the Bible, reach out to us. Email us at info at forward.church or call our office 770-828-5826. Go to our website, find the article on who is Jesus, and get started. He loves you, he's for you, he will lead you and guide you, and we want to help you. If you'd like to give today, you can give directly at our website, forward.church give, or you can text any gift amount to 84321. Thank you so much for your generosity. Would you like to stay connected with us? Then visit forward.church connect and click online guest. You'll receive texts and emails with links to free resources and notifications when we're going live on Facebook and YouTube. You are invited to join our Facebook group, where you can interact with our pastors and our local and online church members. Visit forward.church and click online community under the ministries tab, or go to facebook.com slash group slash forward church. Thanks for watching today. I hope you got something helpful out of this message that you can apply to your life. If you did and you like what you heard, we have hundreds of free resources available online at forward.church or on my blog at clintbyers.com. We also have a church YouTube channel. I have a YouTube channel. We have SoundCloud, Spotify, you name it, we have it out there. Go like and subscribe to our social media platforms and share those. You know, it's, it's really an opportunity for evangelism to get these materials out online and you can help us. I would ask you to consider supporting Forward Church financially, but then you can also be a great help by going to these social media platforms, follow the accounts, like and subscribe to the videos that will drive up our viewership and we will reach more people together. Thanks again for watching. Be sure to like our Facebook page and subscribe to our YouTube channel so you don't miss out on any of our new content. We invite you to make the journey. Experience transformation from the heart through our free discipleship resources available at forward.church slash the journey. There you'll find free online courses, recommended reading, and other resources. For tons of free messages and other great resources, go to clintbuyers.com.